What's going on everyone? Now, as per my last video announcement, I was planning yesterday to begin my new series on the God of the Bible, Yahweh versus the God of Islam, looking at them and comparing them through multiple lenses and, and topics. And I thought it was going pretty smoothly until I opened YouTube yesterday and in my recommended, I saw a video from none other than Muhammad Hijab. Now, I'm not even subscribed to Hijab, but I guess because I've watched a few of his videos in the past to familiarize myself with him, the YouTube algorithm basically put this new one, which he had just uploaded, into my recommended. And although I'll kind of get some weird YouTube videos in my recommended because of that algorithm, I gotta say that I'm extremely glad that this one showed up. Because once I watched it, I immediately knew I had to make a video. Now, as you can see from the title of this video, his video was about biblical proof that Jesus wasn't really crucified. And so, pretty bold claim, right? So I wanted to check it out. I wanted to see what the case being made here was. And you know how they say you know something is really funny if you laugh at it even when no one else is around you? Well, I was alone in my room when I watched this, and by the end of it, I was, I was bawling in, in a good way. And so I want to go through this, and even though I found it to be kind of ridiculous, I just want to present the argument in full, uh, honestly, and to just give my two cents, and I'll let you, as the viewer, decide if this argument that he presented on his channel is one that really holds up. This isn't anything to necessarily go after him, it's just to look straight at the ideas and the arguments and really make that case as to whether or not it is truly viable. And so let's go ahead and roll it. One of the most contested issues between Christianity and Islam is the crucifixion. The death of Jesus on the cross is taken by Christians as an almost indisputable fact of history. Yet, the Quran makes the bold claim that Jesus was not crucified. In this video, we are going to see that the Quran has a remarkable insight into biblical prophecy, which proves that the Messiah was saved by God. The New Testament reports the following encounter between Jesus and Satan. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Here, Satan tested Jesus with a diabolical challenge. Biblical prophecy foretold that angels will protect you, so prove it right by throwing yourself from a great height. Now, notice the response of Jesus. He does not accuse Satan of twisting scripture. Rather, he says, it is also written, which is an affirmation that the prophecy is indeed about him. Christian Bible commentaries confirm that the quoted prophecy is messianic. For example, the Jamieson, Fawcett and Brown commentary states, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, as if he should say, true, it is so written, and on that promise, I implicitly rely. So already from the jump, pay attention to the hypocrisy that we see here from this Muslim narrator. Our Bible's corrupt, but they want to use our corrupt Bible to justify their argument for why Jesus wasn't crucified. Even more so, if they want to trust the words of Jesus in Matthew 4 to justify their reading of Psalm 91, then they'll also want to trust the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, 16, 17, and 20, in which in all of these passages, he predicts his own death and resurrection. Was Jesus lying? Well, obviously not if you're willing to quote him in Matthew 4 as authoritative in order to justify how you read Psalm 91. But again, we don't really want to consider that now, do we? So already from the jump, we could get rid of the argument because of the fact that they're willing to pit themselves into this corner by quoting the words of Jesus when it suits them, but by ignoring them when they don't. Also, it's very important to remember that regarding Psalm 91, there's no theological or scholarly consensus regarding whether or not it's messianic. Some believe, uh, according to Jewish tradition, that it was from David written to Solomon and all these different kind of things. And so obviously you can see Jesus when reading it, but it could also just be read as a general promise in which you see the promises of those who trust in the Lord and how he protects them, which is a bit different compared to Psalms like Psalm 22, in which we clearly see Jesus quoting this and applying it to himself while on the cross. So biblically speaking, within the confines of the Bible, the only real authority who actually applies Psalm 91 to Jesus is Satan himself. And so Muslims have now resorted to quoting Satan to try to prove that Christianity is false. Go figure. But for the sake of argument and to flesh out the rest of this video, let's go ahead and keep rolling it. 
Let's now take a closer look at the prophecy applied to Jesus. It's quoted from the Old Testament book of Psalms. No harm will overtake you, nor disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honour him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. We can see that this prophecy in Psalm 91 mentions that Jesus will not be harmed, that the angels will guard him, and that God will rescue and deliver him. Okay, so here's a very important point in the video. Just because what Satan is saying regarding that verse in Psalm 91 is technically true, doesn't mean that what he's saying is not being misapplied when forsaking the larger context, which is exactly why Jesus counters him by quoting a verse to put it in context. Here's an example. If I had a child and I told my child, hey, I'm gonna give you this credit card and it'll cover costs, whatever you need, all right? But the rule is that this card can only be used in the case of emergency. So, you know, accidents or whatever, you know, whatever I say qualifies for an emergency. And my child understands and I give them the card and then maybe the next day they're out at the mall with their friends and they feel extremely tempted to buy a PS5. Assuming there are sufficient funds, if Satan himself appeared to my child in the video game store and said to him, just go ahead and buy the PS5, I mean, you know the card's gonna cover the cost, would Satan be lying? No, you'd be telling the truth, the card would cover the cost, assuming there are sufficient funds. But what is he forgetting here? Or what is he intentionally not mentioning? The fact that within the context of getting the card in the first place, it was only supposed to be used for emergencies. And it's a similar case here with Jesus. Satan is telling him, hey, Psalm 91, if you jump off, God's going to protect you. And Jesus being the son of God is completely protected and in the total care of the father. But that's predicated by what? It's predicated by that relationship in which Jesus is walking in obedience and tempting the Lord by intentionally putting himself in situations that will cause him to test him or do these things is not walking in obedience. Now, I'm not saying this as if sin is a problem for Jesus and he has to actually, you know, really debate it in his head. But nevertheless, the point still stands that the entire promise of Psalm 91 is predicated on one who trusts in the Lord, walks in obedience to him. And that includes not tempting the Lord your God, which is exactly what Jesus said. So, of course, yes, Satan is telling the truth, so to speak, but he's not telling the whole truth. And so, intentionally, you could say that he's being pretty deceptive. I mean, let's use our heads here. All of Psalm 91 is about God's protection and provision to those who trust him, not to those who are walking around in disobedience and intentionally putting themselves in situations to tempt him and to test him. And so, it already falls flat. And so, knowing that about Jesus and knowing how he walked completely in the will of the Father, he never disobeyed, then it makes sense to see how God would protect him. But when we say protect, are we referring to the context of the crucifixion and him protecting him from that? Or are we talking about something else? Well, let's actually look at the very same commentary that the video itself cites from, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. And they actually reference a chapter that is a nightmare for every Muslim out there who attempts to deny these things about uh, Jesus. So this is the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary. Where regarding verses 9 through 12 of Psalm 91, they write, This exemption from evil is the result of trust in God, who employs angels as ministering spirits. And then they reference Hebrews 1.14. Now, what's Hebrews 1.14 about? What's Hebrews 1 about? Well, this is the nightmare chapter. Because, as I said before, if we read just the bottom, where 13 and 14 are, we see that it says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, being God, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now, what's the context of Hebrews 1? Who's God speaking to and why is he saying these things? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged for our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And if that weren't enough, let's go to Hebrews 2. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And so just from looking at this, we have a case close. They're citing from the very same commentary in which they affirm the reason that Jesus came and was ministered to by spirits was because of his obedience, even unto death with obedience at the cross. Now, this is where the prophecy gets even more interesting. We actually find the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua, is the very last word in the prophecy. The Hebrew word Yeshua means salvation. So not only does this prophecy explicitly foretell a saved Messiah, it even foreshadowed his very name, Yeshua. It is clear that any claims of a crucified Jesus completely contradict this prophecy. All right, here we go again with this ridiculous whole thing about names in the Bible. They try to do this with the name Muhammad and things like Song of Solomon, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. But even looking at this chapter with Psalm 91, the word in Hebrew there is Bishuati. I think that's how it's pronounced. Forgive me if that's, if that's wrong. But nevertheless, although that word salvation can be used in a spiritual or religious context, you know, of spiritual salvation from hell or whatever, it can also be used in a non-religious, just purely physical context, which is exactly why when you even look up this word, its most nearest reference are things like deliverance and rescue. And even more so when looking at the entire chapter, it's all purely physical. It talks about deliverance from physical harm and from physical circumstances. Obviously, there are instances in the Bible when it could be used in a spiritual sense, but there's nothing in Psalm 91 here to indicate some type of salvation that's uh, spiritual and, and, and theological in a sense. It's just talking about who, he who trusts in God and how God will deliver him from that physical peril. I mean, these Muslims always try and do this. They tried this with Song of Solomon. And yet the same word for that, that you see there that they claim is Muhammad is also used in uh, Ezekiel regarding Ezekiel's wife. So would that make Muhammad transgender then? It doesn't make any sense. We have to go beyond just simple words and what they sound like and actually look at the context and everything surrounding it. But again, apparently that's too much to ask for. This is what the Quran says about the crucifixion. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهِ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعَ الظَّنِّ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا The foundation of Christianity is the crucifixion. For the Quran to come along, nearly 600 years later and challenge it is quite bold. Let's consider this from a psychological perspective. If Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was a false prophet, then he would have just gone along with New Testament claims that Jesus was crucified. This would have made it easier for Christians to convert to Islam, so there would have been a lot to gain. But Islam is not about what is convenient, it's about the truth. This point doesn't really make much sense either. If Muhammad were a false prophet and this religion and this ideology were from Satan himself, then the last thing they would want to affirm is the crucifixion of Jesus, because that would only bring them one step closer to the reason behind the crucifixion, which was the atoning sacrifice of Christ for the sin of the world. So I don't really see how attesting to the crucifixion would actually help the case of Islam. The Quran is crystal clear. Jesus was saved from the crucifixion, being raised up to God, alive and unharmed. These verses show remarkable insight when we analyze them in detail. The Quran's claim that Jesus was saved by being raised up perfectly mirrors the prophecy in Psalm 91, which foretold that Jesus would be saved by being lifted up by angels. We can see that what the Quran reports about Jesus is in fact the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would not be harmed. Now look, this is a very internal argument, right? They just simply want to look at Psalm 91 versus Matthew 4. Completely ignore the facts of history, all of the extra biblical writings that have proceeded, I mean, decades down the line, all attesting to at least the fact that Jesus was crucified. They want to completely ignore all of that, and that's fine, okay. Obviously, not very scholarly, but let's give them that. And even if we do that, 
there's still a major elephant in the room that must be acknowledged regarding this argument. If according to Islam, Allah was going to protect Jesus and he didn't have to do anything, he wouldn't be hurt, he wouldn't be killed, and they would be taking him to heaven, the angels, and he would be completely preserved, then why would it be a temptation for Satan to come to Jesus and tell him to throw himself down from the temple? How is that a temptation if all Jesus has to do in life is literally just live his life and just do his thing? And then once he hits a certain point, he's going to heaven. Why would it be a temptation for him to jump off a temple and kill himself? Was Jesus suicidal? Now, I know Muhammad tried to do these things when he first started to get his revelations. But what about this in any way makes it a temptation for Jesus? If God told me in my dream or something like that, that I was going to die peacefully in my sleep, I'd be happy, right? I wouldn't want to die a horrific death. And then if Satan comes along to me and says, hey, you know, why don't you jump out in front of that bus or that railroad or that uh, train? Why would I be tempted to do that when I already know what's coming? It's not a temptation. It's stupid. And so unless we clearly see, as we originally know within Christianity, that the point was to tempt Jesus from going to the cross, then that would make sense. Because what I've often heard is that the reason uh, Satan, Satan tried to tempt Jesus with this is because if he would have jumped down from the temple and would have, you know, there would have been some miraculous event where he was completely protected, then everyone would have seen him and they would have followed him immediately then and there. Meaning, what's the point of going to the cross? You've already got all these followers willing to listen to you. And that makes sense at face value until you forget the fact that he still, need, still needed to atone for their sins. And so it's all surface level with the devil, just as it is with this argument. And it doesn't really hold water again once you look beneath that surface. One of the reasons that Jewish people reject Jesus is because of the crucifixion. They know that the Messiah cannot be crucified, based on Old Testament prophecies that we have seen. The Messiah is supposed to be someone who will be victorious, so any claim that he was whipped, tortured, and died in humiliation is a contradiction. So, the New Testament claims that Jesus died ironically justifies the Jewish rejection of him. The Qur'an removes the stumbling block of a crucified Messiah and paves the way for the Jewish people to accept Jesus. Many have criticised the Qur'an and its audacity in challenging the New Testament crucifixion narrative. We have seen that it is in fact the New Testament accounts written by anonymous authors decades after Jesus which claim that Jesus was crucified, a complete contradiction of Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would be saved from death. These prophecies are a vindication of the Qur'an's position and proof of its tremendous insight into the actual life and mission of the Messiah. Why don't I go ahead and give you a quote from none other than the third person in the Islamic Trinity, Dr. Bart Ehrman. And we'll see what he had to say regarding whether or not the crucifixion actually happened. I know you guys love to cite him when you want to critique the Bible and, and, its, and its preservation and all of these things. Why don't we go ahead and see what he has to say regarding this area as well, since you obviously see him as some kind of authority. There were various expectations of what the Messiah would be, but there was one thing that all of the expectations had in common. Jews who expected a Messiah expected a great, powerful figure who would destroy the enemy and set up God's kingdom. And who was Jesus? The Christians said that Jesus was a crucified criminal. If you wanted to make up a story about the Messiah, would you make up the story that the Messiah had been crucified? That's the opposite of what the Messiah is supposed to be. If you want to make up a story about a Messiah, you'd make up the story that, well, he actually drove out the Romans and he is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Why didn't they make up that story? Because it obviously wasn't true. The early Christians were not going around saying that God had been crucified. They were saying that Christ had been crucified. Well, why did they do that if it didn't make any sense to expect a crucified Messiah? It was because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they knew that he got crucified. You can't explain the crucified Messiah as something that was made up. The crucified Messiah is because people thought Jesus was the Messiah and they knew that this man had been killed as a crucified criminal.